why is Africa always considered to be influenced by different countries? Whenever Africa is the subject of debate, people only talk about who will influence and use African countries. In this zero-sum game, African countries are always on the losing end because they never thought about influencing the world. But this will change as Rwanda's president Paul Kagame has said at the United Nations General Assembly and in his various interviews. He just reversed the entire equation by saying that from this moment on, the era of influencing Africa is over. Now African countries like Rwanda will start to rise, changing their position at the high table. If earlier they were the order takers, then now they will be order givers and the West has to listen to them and follow whatever they are told. In his interview, he gave easier suggestions, but no African leaders dared follow them to make their countries great. What did he say? And how did his words get the West worried? Let's know about it in this video. Paul Kagame has been ruling Rwanda, a small landlocked nation with a population of 13 million, for over 23 years. The country's journey since the devastating civil war and genocide in 1994 is one of significant progress. Therefore, he knows better than anyone else what should be done to make Africa great again. That's why we saw Rwanda excelling in various sectors, including education, technology, healthcare, and security, transforming it into an African success story. However, despite these advancements, Kagame's extended leadership doesn't necessarily equate to an African utopia, and he knows the reason. During a recent interview, he opened himself up, sharing his opinions on what he plans to do with Rwanda. When he was asked about his prolonged tenure, considering constitutional changes permitting him to stay in office for an additional 10 years, his answer was quite rational. Kagame said that it's not merely about one individual, but about various segments of the population who facilitate this continuity. He said that if an African country wants to make radical changes that can pave a way which earlier did not exist, leaders have to be given extended time. It's because the policies made by Western puppets for decades cannot be overruled in only a few years. Saying the opposite of what the world often thinks about him as a dictator, he said that Rwandans actively participate in the decision-making process, shaping the nation's leadership through their judgments. Kagame stressed that Rwandans have been empowered to participate in decision-making, and he expressed confidence that capable leaders will emerge when the time is right. Questions arise about whether this centralized leadership remains the linchpin of governance, or whether Kagame needs to substantiate leadership through alternative institutions and national narratives. Kagame clarified that many developments in Rwanda are unfolding organically, but they are built on a foundation rooted in various factors. He acknowledged that society did disintegrate in the past, necessitating a rebuilding process from scratch. People across society took on individual roles and responsibilities, harboring ambitions that exceeded all expectations, the unity and determination of the Rwandan people have been instrumental in propelling the nation's progress. Kagame clarified that while external contributions are valuable, they cannot supplant the determination and agency of the Rwandan people in addressing complex challenges. Saying that he and all Africans are students of history on what was done to Africa, he said that Africans cannot forget their origins, specifically the dark chapter of genocide in Rwanda. However, he said that people in Rwanda must also look ahead to a united and prosperous nation. But what is the story of the genocide? Well, back in 1994, within just 100 days, over 800,000 people in Rwanda were slaughtered. It was something humanity had not seen before. Approximately 85% of Rwanda's population consisted of Hutus, but the Tutsi minority historically held sway in the country. In 1959, Hutus successfully overthrew the Tutsi monarchy, prompting tens of thousands of Tutsis to seek refuge in neighboring countries, including Uganda. In response to these events, a cadre of Tutsi exiles came together to establish a rebel faction known as the Rwandan Patriotic Front, or RPF. In 1990, the RPF launched an invasion of Rwanda, leading to protracted fighting until a peace agreement was reached in 1993. However, the night of April 6, 1994, marked a tragic turning point. A plane carrying the then-president, Juvenal Habyarimana, and his Burundian counterpart Cyprian and Tariamira, both of Hutu ethnicity, was shot down, claiming the lives of all on board. Extremist Hutus immediately pinned the blame on the RPF and initiated a meticulously organized campaign of mass killings. The RPF countered that Hutus had brought down the plane to provide a pretext for the genocide. The genocide was executed with horrifying precision. 
Government opponents' names were distributed to militias, who systematically executed them along with their entire families. Neighbors turned against neighbors, with some husbands even murdering their Tutsi wives, fearing reprisal if they refused. At the time, identity cards specified people's ethnic backgrounds, which facilitated the slaughter at roadblocks where Tutsis were often hacked to death. A gruesome task made easier as many Rwandans kept machetes at home. Thousands of Tutsi women were abducted and subjected to sexual slavery. Hutu extremists established a radio station called RTLM and circulated hate-filled propaganda in newspapers, inciting the population to exterminate the cockroaches, a derogatory term referring to the Tutsis. Prominent figures to be eliminated were publicly named on the radio. Shockingly, even clergy members, including priests and nuns, were convicted of taking part in the killings, including those who sought refuge in churches. After the 100-day killing spree, approximately 800,000 Tutsis and moderate Hutus had lost their lives. It was a dark chapter out of which modern Rwanda emerged. Paul Kagame expressed his vision, emphasizing the creation of an environment where citizens can lead ordinary lives, a vision gradually materializing in Rwanda. To someone arriving in Rwanda today, unaware of its turbulent history, it might be challenging to fathom the horrifying events that once occurred. While the journey remains long, he said that the ultimate goal is to secure stability, freedom for all, peaceful coexistence, and most significantly, social and economic development. The aspiration is to extend the same opportunities that some regions of the world have long enjoyed. When asked about the reasons for coups in Africa, he said that the world frequently fails to learn wisdom from past experiences. The occurrence of these coups, whether domestically or abroad, warrants scrutiny of their underlying causes. Are they isolated, arbitrary events, or do they emerge from deep-seated issues that have been neglected over the years? Regrettably, this critical aspect has not received the attention it merits. He said that the main question therefore becomes, what steps can be taken to promote development within these societies and nations? Interestingly, talking in a rather unorthodox style, he said that Africa's deprivation is often taken as a given, a fixed state, which is far from the truth. Africa is immensely wealthy and blessed with abundant natural resources and human capital. The continent possesses the potential to harness these resources effectively, with the crux lying in governance. How countries govern themselves, prioritize their citizens, and execute development initiatives assumes paramount importance. Kagame said that when one witnesses these coups and the public support for them, it signifies more than a mere shift in leadership. It hints at a more profound narrative, prompting another crucial question. Why have developed nations, deeply involved in every African country, been imparting lessons on democracy, human rights, and freedom, while simultaneously exploiting the continent's natural resources? You see, his words were open questions for the West. He said that the developed nations in the West have reaped substantial profits, whether directly or indirectly, from Africa, while the local populations in these regions continue to grapple with poverty. This raises a fundamental question. Why, after 50 years, do these nations continue to profit while the people within the very countries where these activities happen continue to suffer? Paul Kagame expressed his strong belief that colonialism, in a way, has never truly disappeared, but has instead evolved. However, he also stressed the importance of not placing sole blame on external actors for this situation. While blaming the West for Africa's exploitation, he gave a fair share of criticism to the African leaders as well. It's because if African leaders had taken a stand against the West's policies, Africa would have never been in tatters as it is now. The argument is quite strong because today, as we have witnessed coups in Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Gabon, the leaders there are doing what's best for their countries, not what the West will like. If this could be done today, they could have been done in the past as well. However, perhaps African leaders did not muster up enough courage and continued being used as puppets for short-term benefits. But they are to be blamed partly because earlier, they knew if they did the opposite of what the West asked, they could be replaced or assassinated as well. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. Paul Kagame said that a common practice among African politicians is to assign blame to foreign actors or external factors when addressing domestic issues. It's because Africa grappled with the lasting impact of Western imperialism, characterized by oppression and dehumanization. Even after the era of colonization, 
Western influence persisted through neocolonial dominance. Many coups and political instabilities across Africa since the 1960s bear the mark of Western involvement. And this not only became a reason for exploitation in itself, but served as a warning for the African leaders. For instance, the first African coup transpired in 1961, leading to the overthrow and assassination of democratically elected Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba, an important figure in Congolese independence. This tragic event was orchestrated by the United States, Belgium, and Britain. Lumumba's assassination set off a chain of events, including the Western-backed dictatorship of Mobutu Sese Seko and regional conflicts such as Africa's World War, causing a severe humanitarian crisis and the deaths of over 5.4 million people, the deadliest conflict since World War II, along with extensive social and economic devastation. Lumumba's assassination left an unforgettable mark on post-colonial Africa, crippling the Congo's economy, which still struggles today. Similarly, the CIA orchestrated the overthrow of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's government in 1966. Today, Western-trained military officers continue to initiate coups, perpetuating instability in Africa. This cycle of instability and tyranny traps African societies in poverty, partly attributable to Western interference directly or indirectly contributing to conflicts on the continent since gaining independence. While Africa has endured historical injustices, African politicians and bureaucrats often engage in unwarranted blame shifting, avoiding responsibility for the continent's current dire economic situation. Africa's underdevelopment is not solely the result of malicious Western interference. It also stems from corrupt and power-seeking African leaders. Therefore, Kagame called upon Africans to take responsibility for their role. He encouraged self-reflection on why such dynamics persist, particularly when Africa is rich in resources that often seem to benefit others more than its own people. Kagame acknowledged that various approaches could rectify this situation and questioned why they haven't been pursued. While it's tempting to vent frustration or point fingers at those who exploit African resources, Kagame stressed the need to avoid disproportionately blaming the exploited. Kagame has been advocating this message for quite a long time. During his tenure as the chair of the African Union, he stressed the significance of African nations empowering themselves, fostering self-reliance, and sharing best practices. However, he said that the African Union compromised on the internal challenges faced by its member countries, which are reflected daily across the continent. Kagame acknowledged that new organizations like the East African Association of States might seem to lessen the African Union's relevance. Still, he clarified that EWS was designed as a regional economic entity and doesn't inherently undermine the African Union's significance. Kagame suggested that reforming not only the African Union, but also the regional economic communities would enhance the African Union's effectiveness. By improving the functionality of these smaller groups of countries, which typically number around 7 to 10, it would become easier for the African Union, the continent's central governing body, to operate more efficiently. Regarding the recent G20 summit in India, where Prime Minister Modi proudly included the African Union as a parent member, Kagame regarded this as a significant milestone. However, he stressed that this was just the beginning. However, he pointed out that the real challenge lies in ensuring that Africa doesn't merely have a seat at the G20 table, but actively contributes and benefits. Kagame highlighted Africa's untapped potential and the importance of recognizing its strengths and finding ways to leverage them in exchange for what the continent needs from other nations. That's when he opened himself up about Africa being influenced for decades, but not influencing any country. For example, despite being a 54-nation strong continent, Africa stayed fragmented and allowed single countries like France or the U.S. to influence. In other words, a single Western country outweighed 54 African countries. However, he proposed to be united, building an alliance of 54 African countries, having the capability to influence whatever country Africa wants. That's the paradigm shift he is talking about. At present, he confessed the unavoidable presence of Western or alternative forms of influence on the African continent. He pointed out that African influence is often lacking, resulting in a scenario where Africa receives influence rather than exerting its own. He challenged African leaders and the general population to view this as an opportunity for growth and to move beyond a perpetual victim mentality. Kagame recognized the power dynamics that sometimes cast Africa as either victims or perpetrators of various issues when influenced by external powers. Kagame then talked about Rwanda's history, stressing the nation's capacity to learn from its past. He quoted that during a critical juncture in Rwanda's history, when the nation required external assistance, 
the West possessed the capability to intervene, but refrained from doing so. This inaction was further compounded by Rwanda's colonial history, which played a role in the country's problems. Kagame stressed the significance of taking control of one's destiny and pursuing independent improvements, with a focus on achieving equality and human dignity. He extended this perspective to include the entire African continent, envisioning a future where African nations engage with the rest of the world to establish essential equality, human dignity, and societal development. In addressing the enduring effects of colonialism, particularly in Rwanda, where distinctions based on physical attributes and socioeconomic class were created, Kagame acknowledged these divisions. He also confronted the ongoing issue of ethnic tensions and disdain in the region, emphasizing that external entities often perpetuate this perspective. Nevertheless, Kagame underscored the importance of not placing sole blame on external forces for these problems. He urged Africans to take responsibility for addressing these challenges and cautioned against allowing outsiders to sow division. In the opposite case, if all African countries are united, it will give them exceptional power. This will allow African countries to unite their natural resources and leverage them to get influence the same way China did by leveraging on the economy. Not only that, but African countries pool their markets together and start trade with each other, instead of selling their resources to the Western countries. What's more, a unified currency can be made, getting independence from the US dollar and the financial order which ensures the non-Western countries always lose. A unified Africa will be able to harness an immense bargaining power. It's because a non-African country has to think twice before messing with any of the African countries. After all, it will know it can lose 54 countries. Kagame also touched on the complex relationship between Rwanda and the United Nations, particularly during challenging times. He candidly said that the United Nations operates under the influence of the powerful countries that established it. Although all nations are members, some exert more influence than others, leading to an inherent inequality that requires attention. However, he said that he is hesitant to place the entire blame on the UN, as it doesn't offer a straightforward solution. The UN largely follows the direction set by these influential nations. So you could say that I hold an optimistic outlook on this matter, and my message conveys positivity. However, this optimism has its boundaries, contingent on whether people are willing to learn from the past and take action accordingly. It can be said that he does not expect the UN to be neutral because he knows why it was created in the first place. Paul Kagame is the man Africa needs because he is the one who knows how to keep the West in its place. In the past, he has openly spoken his mind various times. Once, he said, Africa and Rwanda decide what we want for ourselves going forward. Kagame didn't hold back in his criticism of what he saw as manipulative policies designed to control African nations under the guise of trade agreements and development initiatives. He offered specific examples to show Rwanda's experience with what he termed punitive measures imposed by the United States. These measures were in response to Rwanda's pursuit of economic growth through the development of its textile industry, a move aimed at reducing its reliance on secondhand clothing imports from the US. He has confronted the West in the past, making statements like, we are not people to be belittled, and how about those in your country who committed crimes in my country? Today, Paul Kagame is perhaps one of the few African leaders who know how to stand before the West and protect his country. During his 23-year rule in Rwanda, he has transformed the country, presenting it as a model state for the rest of Africa. However, he is in no mood to stop. Do you think that in African countries' exploitation, the African leaders are to be blamed equally? Tell us. Do you agree with Paul Kagame that Africa should not be a victim and stand up against exploitation? Let us know your thoughts on how African countries can get out of the zero-sum game where the West ensures they always lose. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about, the black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching and until the next video, stay tuned.